May my parents, teachers, relatives, and friends, fellow Dharma Fairers, be free from enmity and danger. Be free from mental suffering. Be free from physical suffering. May they take care of themselves happily. Walking, you know, walking, right? Yeah, so in the uh, Thai forest tradition, they try to incorporate into the uh, uh, daily life. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Vipassana got many, many uh, technicalities, right? Many terms, right? So I will start off with uh, this thing called the Vipassana Bhumipata, right? The passages on the stages are inside. So this can be found in the third basket of uh, Buddhism, the third, uh, this uh, Tipitaka, right? This Abhidhamma Pitaka, the collection of all the uh, <clears throat> very profound uh, tri uh, these uh, treaties. Right, so uh, I won't explain everything, but this is just a rough overview, right? The ones in red, uh, I won't explain it. I don't think it's necessary to know, right? The important things is actually, uh, we'll explain later what is the five aggregates, right? What is the, uh, the sense basis, right? So a lot of things are repetitive, like the 12 bases and 18 elements. And... Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, a lot of things are repetitive. The feelings, the four noble truths, and uh, yeah, the last one, dependent origination. I may not talk about it. It's very long, so I won't cover this. Okay, so we are going to move on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so starting with the five aggregates, right? Earlier on, we talked about the five aggregates. So these are actually... Uh, the word right aggregate can be sound sound so very profound, you know. Some people what is aggregate? Yeah, so the Singaporeans will be thinking, oh my primary school, the score, <laughs> they call it the aggregate. They pass the primary school leaving education. So so they, they have this thing called the aggregates. What's the total uh score, right? They call it the aggregates. So aggregates is actually these uh, five kind of components, five components that form our attention. So why must we know this thing? Why must we know this thing? Because our uh, totality of experience, right, all the, you know, the happiness and sufferings in life, all the ups and downs, are experienced through our attention. Are experienced through our attention. So it is important to study this mind, right? study this attention, right? so that we can truly understand yeah, the nature of our mind and eventually uh, transcend or overcome suffering. So this is the whole idea of uh, studying this thing. So our attention or mind is composed of five things. They are not separate things, right? They're actually five in one. Five in one. I'll give an example later, right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, for example, let's say if you are seeing something with your eyes, right? So now you have the eye organ, right? You have the sense organ. And you have the screen, the screen right in front of you. So the screen is actually the object. The screen is the object, right? So when your eyes are working, the screen is there and the conditions are right. You now there's lighting and, and so on. And then eye consciousness arises. It means you are aware. Consciousness means you're aware. That means you're aware of what you're seeing, right? You can see this chart over here, right? So this is. I consciousness arise. So when these three uh, come together, right? Your I, the object, and the I consciousness, right? These three are called contact. Uh, yes, the mouth is pointing, right? You have the sense organ, which is the you know your eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, right? Your senses. <clears throat> in Buddhism, we say six senses, right? So uh, in in science in school, primary school, we learn five senses. Right. So whenever the Western educated people, we tell them the six senses, and they think, hey, what is the six sense? ESP, uh, huh? psychic power, I uh, know. So the six senses, uh, they include the last one, the mind, thinking. 
right? Like what you had for breakfast earlier, what you had for lunch. So this is thinking, right? So whatever you imagine, you think that one people cannot see you, right? People cannot hear, people cannot taste, right? So only you can experience. So this is using your mind, right? using your own brain or mind, whatever you want to call it. So, so these are the six senses, right? So these are the six senses we experience the world, right? So when we have all these things, right? These things come to contact, then we can move uh, up at the arrow. Uh, we go to the form, right? So when you pay attention to something, when you look at this screen, for example, right? And there's this thing called the form. So form we covered in the meditations, the past two meditations earlier today. Uh, the form is defined as the four elements, earth, fire, wind, water, right? So earth uh, you know, represents something solid. You look at the screen, you know, there's some object must be there. So you can see the screen and uh, the fire is the temperature, right? hot and cold, uh, wind is the movement, uh, water is the moisture, etc. So these are the uh, four elements that make up the whole universe. So actually these are uh, pre-Buddhist kind of concepts, right? Uh, the whole universe is made of the four elements. Some include more, maybe five elements of space and someone add more, add consciousness, so there are more and more elements. So, uh, yeah, so nothing magical about these elements. They are just uh, uh, categories, right? To categorize our uh, experience. Okay, so this is the thing called form. And we can separate uh, or rather classify, right? Form as part of material called rupa, right? Pali is called rupa. Uh, some people may translate as body, right? Actually, I prefer the translation as form. Right, because if you look at the screen, <coughs> the screen may not equal to your body. Yeah, it is uh, another body outside. Like, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So this is one of the translations. Uh, rupa material. Then the next four aggregates. Yeah, the the one in blue. Uh, the next four aggregates: feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. They are classified as the mind. Yeah, nama rupa. So nama is uh, mind, and rupa is matter. Right, so uh, we are going to talk about uh, nama, which is the mind, the mental aspects. So when we pay attention to something, there will be this thing called uh, feelings. Right, when you look at the screen, right, whether uh, maybe you like, you have pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, or neutral. Right, so maybe you don't like the wording, you don't like the font, right, you don't like the colors, right, so you may have certain feelings. Or you may like it, right? So you have another kind of feeling. So everyone has different feelings. Or if you stare at this screen for too long, the feelings will change also. So uh, the feelings is there, right? Feelings and sensation. So this is another aspect of our attention. And when we pay attention to something, there is also this aspect called perception, right? Perception is basically based on our past memory, you know, whatever we've experienced before. All the terms and jargons, all the words, yeah, all the vocabulary, everything we experienced before will come into play when we identify a new object. Right? When we even look at the screen, you know, P E R C E P. So you already learned this you know, since long ago, right? maybe your preschool, you learned the alphabet. Right? So when you, uh, you, know, when you cognize, Cognize when you pay attention to something, you cognize and you recognize. Oh, this word is called perception. No, you've already learned this before. Then you give a label. So this function of labeling is called perception, right? So sometimes there's a verbal kind of conception. Sometimes there's non-verbal conceptions. Sometimes it's just an experience. You know, you cannot give a label to it, but you experienced before, or sometimes it's a new experience. Then you will give a, a question mark, question mark kind of uh, uh, labeling. Right, so these are uh, various kind of uh, perceptions. Okay, then the uh, <clears throat> next one we are going to talk about is mental formations, right? Mental formations. Earlier on, uh, somebody asked a question on karmic formations. So karmic formations, same as uh, mental formations. Uh, that is the moment the, the thought is being constructed, right? The thought is being constructed, right? So uh, <clears throat> when our Attention arises, right? So that is the moment. So earlier on, I gave an uh, experiment. I did an experiment of raising your, your finger, right? Uh, I was asking the uh, participants to try to identify, you know, point where is your attention right now? 
every moment you try to point away your attention right now? Is it up there all the time? Or is it a screen all the time, right? right. So the, the transition between two attention, right? So that is where you catch this mental formation, right? The moment the thought is being formed. Right. So basically we're trying to understand this. <clears throat> and the last one is consciousness. Consciousness, right? Consciousness is the uh, awareness. And you know, you know, when you see something, you're using eye consciousness. When you're hearing, right? When you hear the, what I'm talking right now, you're using your ear consciousness, so on and so forth. So we have uh, six sense organs, then we have six kinds of consciousness. And of course, in the Abhidharma, you have more kinds of consciousness, uh, maybe 80 over kinds or 90 kinds of consciousness. <clears throat> uh, okay, then this consciousness is basically uh, the sort of, uh, when we are aware of something, right? Then we have these five, basically five in one. <clears throat> so it's uh, sort of important, right? <clears throat> this consciousness uh, is very closely related to karma, right? When we have mental formations, when you have, we call it positive intentions, then our consciousness will be sort of uh, in a higher kind of frequency. When we are guilty consciousness, no, then we have uh, no lower kind of consciousness frequency. So there are different uh, gradings of consciousness. <clears throat> right? So sometimes consciousness can be classified uh, from a very low, you know, very bad moral kind, moral kind of consciousness all the way to a you know, higher concentrative kind of consciousness all the way to uh, liberated kind of consciousness. So there's uh, altitude and uh, we talk about the different... Uh, the different sort of the latitude, the different classifications of consciousness uh, in terms of the sense basis. So, uh, but today's introduction, I won't go through like the Abhidhamma thing anyway. I'm not trained in the Abhidhamma, yeah, so I won't give a very scholastic uh, kind of uh, view on Abhidhamma, right? Okay, so this is a rough idea, right? We are going to uh, later on in the guided meditation, we are trying to identify this five, even right now, you can identify. And when you look at the screen, you now these are the five. When you hear something, is there four elements or not? And when you hear what I'm saying on you know, the vibration in the eardrum, whatever. So all these are the four elements at work. So even like identify, you call this an earth element. That is using your perception already, right? Then you have feelings, you know, whether earth is it too hard or too soft, is it pleasant, unpleasant. So all these are five in one. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> some, uh, maybe some. People interpret, right? In, especially in the later uh, modern Theravada tradition, they have uh, many stages of uh, uh, insight. So one of them is to separate mind and mind and body, or mind and matter, whatever you call it, right? So uh, uh, and here we go, five in one. There's no need to separate. Uh, you want to separate one by one, it's okay. Um, yeah, but we we'll won't talk about that later. Okay, next. Okay, so there we have the evolution of the uh, <clears throat> steps of insight meditation. So chronologically, chronologically in the uh, Buddha's time, the suttas will, uh, you know, the Buddha of great compassion will uh, try to make things easy for people, right? So you just practice one step and a lot of people you know, reach enlightenment. So along the way, you know, some people like to uh, write more things and you know, come up with more ideas. So uh, once the scriptures are put into writing and somebody wrote this thing called the Vimuti Maga from Sri Lanka and the path of liberation has six steps, right? This uh, book called the Vimuti Maga. So there are six steps of uh, Vipassana and uh, one, probably one generation later, then somebody else, right? In, uh, from India came down to Sri Lanka, did some translation of the commentaries and he, he wrote another book called the Visuddhi Maga path of purification. So this time it's 16 steps. So it gets more and more complicated and uh, less and less people get enlightened. And okay, then we move on next. Okay, so in the, the sutta, right? So this is uh, one good clear uh, case example you know, how a person, right? Uh, is a conversation between a new monk and a venerable Sariputta. Early on, we talked about venerable Sariputta being the uh, uh, wisest disciple of the Buddha. So there's a conversation between the two. So 
uh, <coughs> this uh, new monk asked uh, Venerable Saiputai, you know, how is it possible from a, a normal worldly person, right? A uh, person full of desire, uh, desire and whatever not, how can they sort of uh, reach this uh, stream entry, right? So Tapana, you know, a person asked this question, right? Is it possible you know, for, for a person to reach so Tapana? <coughs> then uh, Saiputa replied, yeah, what you need to do, right, is to reflect, reflect on the five aggregates as such. Right, in constant, stressful, disease, cancer, error, painful, affliction, alien, dissolution, emptiness, non-self. What wow, are so many objects of meditation, objects of contemplation? So we just choose one. Right? So for most part in our meditation, we just reflect on this uh, inconstancy, right? this uh, impermanence. Right? Uh, talk about birth and death, rising and falling. So we talk about inconstant. Right? So this is uh, a person from there, then he can reach this... Uh, Stream enter it. Right, then the monk asked another question. How is it possible from a stream enterer enter the next level of uh, the sainthood, right, which is one Sri Turner? It's uh, Sakadagami. Right, so the <clears throat> Venerable Sai Buddha said the same thing. Do the same step. Right, five aggregates, contemplate as inconstant, stressful disease, blah, blah, blah. We just pick one. <clears throat> then the monk asked another question. <clears throat> How do you proceed from a once returner to a non-returner, right? To an anagami, right? Another level higher. higher. <clears throat> then Venerable Saiputta replied the same thing. You know, the five aggregates do the same thing, same step. And the monk asks again, you know, how can a person from non-returner become an arahan? That means fully enlightened, right? Then the same answer, right? In constant, stressful, disease, blah, blah, blah. So actually, just one step, right? Don't need to complicate yourself. So many steps. Most of the steps would include, uh, uh, especially in the post-canonical uh, systems, they include the experience of the yogi, you know, what can the yogi experience or whatever not. So, uh, which I think is very subjective. Everybody has different experience. Uh, but the whole idea is uh, if a person uh, reduces desire and there's uh, dharma joy, right? So they can really see uh, the dharma for themselves. So this is... Uh, uh, real seeing and not just uh, no, uh, faith from just uh, no, theory. Yeah. Okay, next. <clears throat> then next is how to apply, right? So earlier on is uh, talk about this contemplation on the impermanence, uh, suffering, non-self and whatever not. So uh, there's this application right from the second official discourse of the Buddha Right, the first discourse, the Buddha taught the five monks, his first five disciples on the Four Noble Truths. And then he carried on, he taught another sermon on the discourse on non-self to the same five disciples, which afterwards the five disciples uh, got enlightened. So, uh, <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the last few portion of the scripture. Right? The last few portions of this Anatta Lakana Sutta. Right? How to contemplate in your daily life. So we have so many cognitive functions, right? So, uh, so this is application, right? Does monks, any form, feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness, right? the five aggregates. How can you practice observing these five aggregates? So here it goes, be it past, future, or present, right? Internal or external, blatant or subtle, common or sublime, far or near. Right, every form also can practice. Right, this is uh, no non-self, uh, impermanent, whatever not. <clears throat> so, so we're going to the first point. How is it possible, right, to contemplate past, future, or present? Right, a lot of times, uh, <clears throat> people when they talk about meditation, people will, will always say, "Be at the present moment." Right, be at the present moment. Then, what, what is this? How come got past and future one? Right? Uh, how come got past and future? Can can meditate man? Past and future. Yeah, this is what the Buddha said about past and future. So past, like for example, when we contemplate on the Buddha, right? We think of the, the Buddha's uh, the marriage, you know, he's a great teacher, one of his qualities. So we are actually thinking 2.5k years ago, right? 2500 years ago. Right? So that's thinking of the past. Right? When we're thinking of uh, this uh, birth, aging, sickness, and death. 
right? We're, we're thinking of both past and future. We have a reference, you know, how does uh, uh, the, the dead skin look like, uh, the, the hair dropping off, how does it look like? That's referring to the past. And we're also thinking of the future, you know, one day we get old, one day we get sick, one day we pass away. So that's thinking of the future, right? Yeah, so uh, <coughs> again, uh, any kind of contemplation, be it past, future, or present, must be done correctly, right? Without uh, the correct alignment, without the middle uh, way mindset, a person can be practicing wrongly. So if a person, uh, let's say they think of the past, if they don't have the middle way mindset, they end up, they become worrying, worrying on the past, or maybe fantasizing on the past, then becomes not meditating anymore, right? Same thing, when the person think of the future, if they do not have right, right thoughts, right contemplation, and when you think of the future, become planning, yeah? planning and planning and planning. So it becomes not meditation anymore. Right? Same thing at the present. Right? Uh, some people say meditation must be at present. So I give a few examples. Let's say uh, <coughs> uh, um, bodybuilders and supermodels, right? they always like, like to look at the mirror. Right? They flex their muscles or look at their body, you know? uh, do whatever pose they want to do. Very present, always <laughs> mindful of the body, right? present moment. But is this the right kind of mindfulness, right kind of present moment, right? So uh, uh, is it devoid of greed and hatred, right? So we have to uh, question ourselves on that. So the whole idea of uh, understanding, right, this past, future, and present is to diversify the practice, right? And diversify our practice. Some systems of meditation only uh, maybe focus on one, one kind of training, right? Earlier on, we talked about, you know, there's... Uh, Samatha and Vipassana, you know, uh, various uh, functions of training. Uh, so if a person just focus on one aspect, and then let's say they, they sort of uh, go into daily life, there are a lot of meditators, a lot of yogis who complain, oh, I cannot meditate anymore, you know? I only can meditate in meditation class, or I only can meditate in a retreat, I only can meditate in a meditation center. You know? So they have this kind of excuse, right? But actually, uh, we are supposed to practice in everyday moment. So let's say uh, if a person wants to fill, uh, fill up a, a form, right? They want to apply for a job. They have to apply a form, right? Maybe write their CV, resume, right? So we ask, you know, when is your birthday? You cannot put present moment, right? You straight away reject you, right? You, you won't get a job. You need to think of the past, right? So how, how to apply Detachment, even when thinking of the past or thinking of the future, right? So this is uh, and, uh, uh, what we are aiming for. Yeah, the ideal state is, you know, whatever we do in our daily life, we can practice uh, detachment, right? Bringing uh, practice into uh, daily life. <laughs> okay, then the next one is internal or external, right? So internal, that means, you know, uh, thinking here, or some people interpret as in the mind, right? So we think in the mind. So it can be internal, uh, then external, right? Early on, we do the meditation, we think of all beings, you know, in the whole world. So that's external, internal yourself, external, uh, outside, outside of yourself. So this is uh, another kind of training. So medi uh, all these are actually training, right? The different kinds of various uh, cognitive functions and processes, right? How we are able to be detached in whatever scenario. And the next one, blatant or subtle. Right? Blatant is something coarse, right? Subtle is uh, maybe something like what we imagine in our mind. Blatant is something coarse, right? Like a physical body. So when we do, let's say, the uh, asupa meditation, right? Think of our hair, think of our teeth. So that is imagination, right? When we think further, uh, uh, some people want to do the full practice, think of our brain, think of our bones, our skull. Now, how many of us ever seen our brain before? You know? how, how many of us ever seen our skull our own uh, rib cage and whatever not right so all these require imagination right so all these are very uh, subtle objects right subtle objects and the next one common or sublime so these are you know we talk about sublime states of mind uh, very noble kind of emotions like loving kindness uh, compassion appreciative joy equanimity so all these are considered uh, Sublime states of mind, even common states of mind, you know, our circular uh, states of mind, anger, you know, greed, you know, uh, scattered mind, whatever. So, uh, <clears throat> any kind of emotion, right, states of mind that arise also can be put into practice, can practice impermanent suffering 
uh, non-self can reflect. Eh? So somebody asks a person, uh, no, you don't have uh, uh, jhanas can practice, no, eh? can can practice, common states of mind can practice. Right? <clears throat> so I gave a, a sutta example earlier, this uh, uh, Asubha Sutta. Yeah, the, there are two, uh, two sort of modes, pleasant and unpleasant uh, modes of practice. So the Buddha was mentioning if a person uh, practice this uh, Asubha meditation uh, only, uh, then this is the painful part, the unpleasant part, but can reach enlightenment. Right? But if a person practice uh, jhanas or concentration, uh, that is the pleasant part. Right? So uh, no, there are different methods. Okay, then far or near, right? So it's the same as internal, external. So it can be uh, near, you know, within yourself, and far, right? Far away. So some people think uh, uh, meditation is you no know, just here and now, here and now, right here, right now. Of course, uh, depends on the context how you how you see. You no, know, some people can you know, just look at the somebody's uh, funeral, somebody's corpse, and they reflect, and they go, and they can get realization. See. Is far away, not even uh, near to you. You know, can be from a television screen or just hearsay only. You know, hear a report or somebody you know uh, pass away, so on and so forth, and they reflect on life. You know, meaning of life, and then they you know have certain realizations. Okay, so uh, these are uh, the various we call it the cognitive functions. So uh, why we do all you know the various kinds of meditations we did earlier is to train you know, various uh, cognitive uh, function. Like earlier on, the first meditation we did is the uh, asupa meditation, the impurities of the body. So it requires some visualization, think of the hair, think of the head, no? think of your teeth, your nails, your skin, some visualization. So it's within, you know, like in your brain, right? Your mind. So uh, it works like as a control, works as a control. Just like in our daily life, we need to worry and plan. So a lot of things is uh, visual. We need to imagine the problem, imagine the scenario. So using that uh, sort of picture or visualization of whatever problems we plan, <clears throat> how can we practice detachment, right? So when we practice the uh, our super meditation, is actually using the our body as a control, our body parts as a control. So we use this. We train, 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 day in, day out, every day. Then hopefully we can bring it to a daily life scenario, right? Where we worry and think, you know, how to apply loving kindness to, you know, to whatever you, you visualize or problems you're planning and how to practice impermanence, right? Seeing this as, you know, you change and decay or whatever not. So this is uh, a way of letting go. So it is the first phase. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, second uh, kind of meditation we did was uh, breath, right? And breath meditation, we did some focusing, uh, right, so when, when let's say look at the screen or when we are reading something, right, sometimes we sort of uh, focus on something. We are, we are narrowing our attention, restricting this attention to one spot. So this is any training that my mind is uh, fixing at one spot. Can you practice detachment? Right, so this is the uh, second kind of training. Of course, we generally did something further. We went to different uh, jhanas, right, there is an added. Uh, supplement, you know, you charge your battery of the mind. And the third uh, kind of thing we are doing uh, earlier on is the uh, radiate of loving kindness. No? We send to different directions. So in life, we need to, you know, sometimes we cross the street, we need to look across the road, you know, look at different directions. So how to practice uh, paying attention in any direction no? without creating any stress, how no? to practice detachment in a different direction. So all these are uh, sort of uh, different application. Uh, so one more kind of meditation that we didn't do is actually in the uh, this undirected or vipassana kind of meditation. So hopefully after the lecture, I mean after this uh, talk, you get a chance to uh, practice uh, this uh, vipassana kind of meditation, right? So the the idea of this uh, undirected meditation is when the mind is scattered, when it's relaxed. Can it still practice detachment? So this is the uh, actually one of the highest form of practice when the mind is not doing anything, you know, still can be detached, right? All the previous exercises require the mind to fix on something, require the mind to generate something, right? So the 
uh, the mind when it's scattered and relaxed and doing nothing, that is, uh, uh, we are training, right, the mind to be unconditioned. So that is the, uh, not easy, requires certain uh, uh, foundation of samadhi first before doing it. Right? If not, it's uh, no different from uh, daydreaming. Very easy to enter into daydreaming mode. Okay, so I will uh, move on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so we are going to uh, talk about physical preparation, right? We should have talked about this earlier. So, but never mind, this is for your own uh, practice, right? Because next week we have another retreat. So, this is for you all to uh, sort of uh, prepare and practice yourself how to uh, you know, sit properly and whatever not. So, we have a few kinds of preparations. Uh, important is uh, light meals. Right, because if you have heavy meals, uh, the next thing we know is all the blood will rush to the digestive system. Not enough blood, uh, blood goes to the brain, and everyone will be like sleeping. Right, so uh, some people sleep there after the meditation. They say, "Oh, I feel so refreshed." You know, meditation so calm, so relaxed, refreshing. Uh, actually, they're sleeping. Right, so uh, important to uh, calm down the mind. Yeah, very important. <coughs> okay, then next is. Uh, if you want to sit on the floor, right, make sure you have comfortable clothing. A lot of people, some people wear uh, jeans, tight jeans or whatever, not then. They sit down for a while, only, uh, leg numb, leg cramp, you know, cannot feel the leg, right? Not, not because you enter samadhi, but because the blood cannot flow, right? Then you have all these uh, numbness and pain and whatever not. So uh, some uh, comfortable clothing is important. And if you have free time, yeah, please do some stretching, right? You know, you try the walking meditation, stretching, keep the blood circulation going. Uh, when you stretch the muscles, then you won't feel tense. Uh, sitting down for you know, long hours uh, can be uh, quite uh, harmful, right, to the body. <laughs> and the uh, next one is, uh, uh, yeah, this is for you know, those who come in my meditation class uh, before the lockdown. Uh, yeah, handphone turn to silent mode, right? And empty your pockets. You sit down, uh, make sure your pockets is you know, free from your keys, your wallet, and whatever not. You know, sometimes you put it in the back pocket, then you sit down, then your backside will be lopsided, you know, one up, one down, right? So you feel uncomfortable and whatever not. So this is a few kind of preparations. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, next we are going to talk about the uh, meditation. Uh, postures, meditation postures. So we are going to first talk about the uh, top uh, right picture, right? T top right pictures, we talk about the back. So if you are seated in be it a chair on the floor, uh, it's important to take note of the spine, right? The, the whole idea is uh, the tip is uh, required to have an effortless upright posture. Uh, one of the ways is to tilt the lower spine forward a bit, maybe one degree or half a degree, whatever, then you can find the center of gravity, right? Natural center of gravity. So you don't require a lot of core muscles, don't require six pack abs, yeah? To sit up straight, right? You find, you tilt in a way where your, you know, where your body is naturally upright. Okay, this is, Let's say if you have back injury, right? If you have back injury, then you might consider leaning on something. But if let's say you don't have any back injury and you want to prevent back injury, uh, this is one of the way, right? You keep an uh, important back upright. If you slouch and hunch for too long, then uh, you have back injury and you develop back aches. Right? So this is uh, uh, nothing ritualistic, is uh, all these uh, safety precautions. Okay, then if we look at the bottom row, the bottom row, okay, so all these are uh, sitting on the floor techniques, right? <clears throat> so if on the left, if you are very flexible, if you are very flexible, then you can try, you can try sitting full lotus posture. So you can emulate uh, a lot of the Buddha statues, uh, you know, both legs being crossed on both thighs, on top of both thighs, right? So the benefit of this uh, posture would be uh, that all the 
parts of the of your lead, of your feet, right? On I mean your thighs and your calves will be touching the ground. That means there's a wide surface area. So it's a very balanced posture, very stable and balanced posture. So this is the plus point. Right? And of course you need to be flexible. If not, the the drawback will be it'll be very painful, excruciating pain to those who are not flexible. Right? So the whole idea of the, the posture is to find a comfortable uh, sitting so that it at least can last you for some time. But no matter which posture you sit, uh, sure we have pain one because we have nervous system. Even lying down and sleeping, uh, you sleep for, <laughs> for a certain no, period of time, also we have pain, right? So this is the nature of the body, right? You can't be free from pain. So the whole idea is to find a posture that is comfortable enough that can... Uh, <coughs> sort of allay the pain slightly longer. All right, so this is the full lotus. And then if you cannot do the full lotus, we have a 50% discount for you. So we have half lotus, All right? Half lotus doesn't require both feet on top of uh, both thighs. You just have one. So either the left or the right up to you. I, I don't really care about the posture. Some purposely must, oh, must be on the right leg on top of the left, whatever. So to me, it doesn't matter. Yeah? So either left or the right on top, right? So the uh, <coughs> drawback will be you feel lopsided. You feel lopsided. And a lot of times, uh, because when you sit one leg up, when one of the knees is up, it will cause uh, some imbalance. So you require a cushion, a, a cushion in your back, right? To keep your spine upright. So this is a uh, half lotus. You require a sitting meditation cushion to uh, lift up your backside. Right? So this is the half lotus. Okay, then if you still cannot do the half lotus, uh, more discount for you, then we move to the third picture on the right. So you have the Burmese style sitting. Uh, I call it the parallel parking. Right? Both feet parallel to each other. You don't need any feet ab above each other. Right, so this is called the, the parallel parking, yeah? both feet parallel to each other. Right? So both feet on the ground. Uh, so it's also a very stable posture. Right? Quite, uh, I think it's even better than a full lotus. doesn't require that much flexibility and a lot of stability. Right? So this is the, uh, one of the plus points. Right? But if you still cannot do it, uh, if you still cannot do it and you do not have uh, other equipment like a stool or a chair, then you sit normally. Sit your, if let's say you're sitting on the ground, then you sit normally. Uh, if you're not flexible, you sit normally, right? So if you look at the first picture, the full lotus, right? So if a person sits normally, that means uh, both feet on the ground, right? Instead of on the thigh, both feet on the ground. So this is normally how most people sit. <clears throat> but because you uh, attend uh, meditation class, right? So people ask, you know, what kind of posture you sit? You say, I sit normally, Lord, and then sometimes it'll be embarrassing, right? So you don't want to lose face, so you give yourself a new professional uh, name to the sitting posture. So instead of uh, saying you sit normally, you say you sit full lotus inverted posture or inverted full lotus posture, you know, sounds more uh, professional or sounds more cool, right? So people will be wondering, hey, what kind of yoga posture you're sitting, man? What kind of full lotus inverted posture, right? So in uh, instead of both feet up, you sit both feet down, right? So this is uh, your normal sitting. So you tell people I sit full lotus inverted, right? So people think, wow, you do some advanced yoga pose, right? So no, okay. So uh, next one we move to the next one. If you have a stool, then you can. You know, this is more like the Zen style, uh, Mahayana tradition. They have this stool. Right, so this is uh, for sitting. Uh, and the last one, of course, on the chair, which uh, most of you right now, if you're on Zoom, uh, on the internet platform, most people on the chair, uh, most uh, modern city people, right, they spend lots of hours sitting on a chair. <clears throat> so some people say, I meditate, cannot, med cannot sit for so long, la, you know. Uh, people in the office sit for so many hours on a chair. We sit for so many hours. Eh? If you go to a cinema, watch a movie, we can sit two hours straight, no problem, right? I watch a television show, sit for hours, no problem. Or some of the younger generation that play video games can sit for hours and hours, 
no problem. They come to meditation. Ah, yeah, sit for a pain ready la, must shift la, must move la, you know, must do this, must do that, must get out meditation la, eh? So a lot of problems. So a lot of time is again uh, right thoughts. If your meditation uh, technique, the mental technique is correct, it will keep you engaged, right? But of course, uh, <clears throat> in my meditation uh, lesson, the takeaway is uh, every moment uh, right thought. Yeah, right effort, right mindfulness. Uh, I don't really emphasize on the sitting. Right? Sitting is important, yes, for your R&D, for calming down, yeah. Certain research, you know, to, to evaluate yourself. But the, the real practice is your daily life. I can give an example. Uh, let's say a person, uh, let's say learn martial arts, right? They, let's say they go to a dojo, maybe karate, whatever it is. So they learn the moves, right? How to punch, how to kick, how to defend themselves. And they, maybe they try to hit the punching bag. So all these are very static kind of training. So like, like what we are doing, you know, sitting meditation, doing all the routines, doing a super meditation, all these are uh, standard routine moves, right? The real, uh, the real uh, practice, right? I mean, the real uh, fight, real challenge comes when we are out there, right? When, when doing self-defense or even in competition. If let's say the martial artists send you for competition, you know, you have to fight an opponent. So that is the real uh, test of your martial arts. So the real meditation challenge would be right now, every moment, right? When you face problems, when you face uh, the people around you, face uh, stress at work. So all these are real day-to-day uh, -day life scenario issues. So when you talk about you know, training different cognitive functions, yeah, so all these are preparing for this. So eventually, uh, when we talk about somebody asks a question on the last uh, moment of death, so are we ready, you know, last moment of death? So don't talk about last moment of death right now. Or even in life, when you face certain crises here and there, are you even ready, right? So, uh, yeah, so this is the short takeaway. So my takeaway is every moment, right, maintain uh, right thought. Okay, so I end uh, the short, this uh, talk. Any other slides after this? Uh, no that's the end of the slide, okay? Yeah, so we have a Q&A. Anybody can ask any questions? Okay, is it uh, guided first or Q&A first? Oh, okay, there's a guided segment. Okay, then we do the, the guided meditation first. All right, okay, so we are, now we are doing uh, meditation undirected. <clears throat> so for those who have uh, uh, <clears throat> gone through the previous sitting, you know, at least they charge the mind up. Uh, because the samadhi is actually temporary, right? So it depends on uh, how you maintain your mind. So like if a person were to maintain loving kindness, all the way is like a power saving mode. Yeah? You save the power, but if you don't do it, then you drain all the energy and we might need to recharge the mind. But before uh, we do the full routine, right, I'll just do a, a straight away this undirected mind. Right? So uh, probably the next session, then we can uh, do the full routine from the first phase, the asupa, second, concentration, third, uh, which is now what we are doing, this uh, undirected meditation, and then eventually the loving kindness. All right, so now we are just doing the uh, Vipassana meditations alone. So for those who can follow, then you try to follow. If you cannot follow, then uh, try your best, right? Okay, so uh, <coughs> yeah, so this one can be done either in seated meditation or walking meditation, right? Any posture also can be done. So uh, if you want to close your eyes, you may do so. If you want to half close your eyes and uh, gaze downwards also, you may do so. So in this uh, exercise, what we are doing is we're actually <coughs> uh, trying to sort of uncondition the mind. Right? So the mind is actually now uh, in a scattered mode, which is we are not doing anything to the mind. That means we are not directing the mind anywhere. So we basically, we let the mind be free, right? We let the mind autopilot, sort of let the mind run wild. <clears throat> but 
we need to do something. I call it contact tracing. Right, nothing to do with the pandemic. But this contact tracing is basically to trace our sixth sense contact. Right? We have uh, our eye contact, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind contact. So our attention will move around through these six doors, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Right? So we are going to basically understand or try to observe how this attention move around through these six avenues, six doors. So I give an example, right? If I am talking right now, most probably your attention is to my sound. But if I stop talking, where is your attention now? Right, so every moment you have to ask yourself, where is your attention now? Where is your attention now, right? So you need to keep track of your attention without deliberately uh, exerting your mind, without directing your attention anywhere. So the whole idea is to be a passive observer, right? Because we have to uh, truly understand the nature of the mind. So the more natural, the better. So for <clears throat> beginners, I would recommend uh, observing the four elements because there is something more obvious. I want to talk about uh, this uh, mental formation and this uh, maybe you know the other more subtle things. Sometimes harder harder to catch. Actually, there are five in one. So you just observe uh, one of the elements, something obvious, right? Can be the four elements: earth, fire, wind, water. So like we covered earlier, uh, just a short, brief uh, rerun. Uh, the earth element will be anything hard and soft, right? Fire, the temperature, warm and cold. Wind is the movement, fast and slow movements. Water being the moisture, moist or dry. Right? So these are the various sensations. Right? So uh, that is if our, using our sense of touch, you know, we can observe these sensations, if you're hearing something, uh, what is the contact in our ear, yeah, our ear drugs. So I would like to give a metaphor, an example, uh, how to be a passive observer, right? just a metaphor. Right? Imagine uh, like a documentary film, for example, an animal planet, right? some uh, nature documentary. So being a passive observer is something like being a cameraman. Right? We are trying to film an animal, trying to understand the animal, uh, maybe say a, a wild monkey, right? So our mind, our attention is something like a wild monkey, running here, running there, jumping from tree to tree. So the whole idea, being a cameraman, is just to observe, right? Just to understand. You want to understand the nature. That means we don't interfere. No, we just observe, right? How the how the monkey behaves. Sometimes after through this observation, then you have more understanding towards the monkey. So that's the whole purpose of the exercise. <clears throat> and once in a while, there are some new documentaries where the host will try to uh, interfere, you know, we'll try to capture the monkey or wrestle the animal. And usually in the process, they get injured and right? they get beaten by the animal, they get bleeding and whatever not. So uh, you know, these are the newer kind of documentaries. <clears throat> and this is like most of the time, right? When we, we uh, observe something, then we try to interfere, you know, try to react, right? Then we have all these uh, issues, all these sufferings, all these problems, right? So the whole idea is to be a passive observer and uh, don't try to be a, 
uh, like a Steve Irwin, right, try to interfere. So to further narrow down the investigation, right, we can uh, <clears throat> use three reminders or three questions right, to remind ourselves what to look out for. Right, what to look out for. You know, sometimes you know, too wide, you know, what to look out, huh? very, very blur, right? what to observe. So uh, <clears throat> the first uh, question we can ask, uh, using our own personal observation, or this personal evidence, right, is uh, our attention, right? Is it permanent or impermanent by itself? Right? If you don't interfere, you know, by nature, is it permanent or impermanent? So, uh, you know, this is your attention. or within the attention, right? You have the five aggregates, right? Are the five aggregates permanent or impermanent? <clears throat> so this is the first question. And the second question would be, are these five aggregates, right? Is this mind truly self? Is it truly yours? Is it truly you? Do you have total control over the five aggregates, over this mind? Can you tell the form and eh, the temperature to be cooling forever or to, to be warm forever? Right? Can you tell the feelings to be pleasant forever? Or can you tell your attention right, to stay at one place forever? Right? So this is the... Uh, Second question, is it truly self? Do you have total control over these uh, five aspects of the mind or these five aggregates? And question number three, if you try to control the mind, you try to exert control over the mind, will there be suffering compared to not controlling? So this uh, aspect of meditation, this undirected, undirected attention is basically to uh, sort of gather wisdom, right? Squeezing wisdom out of the observations. So how does one know whether you're doing it in the right direction? So the more you observe impermanence 
and uh, sort of letting go, the mind should calm down, right? So earlier on, we already have the Samatha practice, we talk about the mind settling down to stability point, right? That is actually desire, right? The desire getting lower and set the mind settling, the formations settling or reducing. So that is using one point. So now at a wide area, when the mind is not focused, not directed, can the mind practice detachment and continue to settle? Maybe some meditation, uh, or rather some people when they meditate, they want to look out for uh, impermanence or changes of the uh, how the mind arises, where is the starting point, and whatever not. So the more they they want to look, yeah, then the more stress, lots of expectation. So all these are actually perceptions, right? They are not a requirement. The whole idea is the letting go process. If a person's mind is not subtle and they cannot observe, right, the mind and matter, the difference, the mental energy, whatever you call it, right? then doesn't matter, the whole idea is the detachment. If a person can observe right, the subtle differences between the, uh, the mental energy and the body, but they cling on to the mind, try to observe the mind, more stress, no, let, no letting go. So once you're able to calm down the mind, <clears throat> yeah, once you're able to calm down the mind, then you can extend the practice. I mean, condition yourself, right? To extend this practice to other aspects of life. Like for example, walking, right? So you sit down, you can oh, maintain, detach, then you can practice walking, right? So if you want, you can try walking meditation with this frame of mind. How can the mind be sort of undirected and even walking, right? So you can practice that. So without no directing the mind, and you do walking meditation. And this is coming towards the end of the day. Some people are tired, right? And uh, one of the recommendations to uh, uh, avoid this uh, drowsiness is actually walking meditation, right? So even let's say a person really no energy, right? Sitting also can... Uh, you feel sleepy, uh, then you can do walking meditation. Yeah, so when you walk, then you can observe, you know, your uh, wherever your attention naturally goes. So let's say if you're walking, most probably your attention goes to your feet, sometimes goes to uh, uh, you know, where the, your path on where you're walking, right? So the whole idea is to understand how your attention moves around, observe the uh, elements, four elements, then you slowly extend this range from walking to all your daily chores in your daily life.
And what we can do now is again, we can use whatever, right? We've learned from this uh, insight meditation and we can even extend further, right? Uh, from undirected mind, uh, then we infuse into loving kindness. That means uh, even when directing the mind in a certain direction, how can you do it in a detached manner, right? So using whatever, you know, you observe the five aggregates and impermanence. We are going to now uh, direct this attention in front. So we're going to wish all beings in front, may they be well and happy. So the challenge is you know, how to be truly well and happy. Right? Earlier on, we talked about controlling the mind or stress. Right? So yeah, how to direct the mind without stress. So this is the challenge. So there's no need to uh, visualize any person, right? We just have a general concept. We all beings in front, we well and happy. Uh, so when we think in front, are you still able to observe right, these five aggregates and these impermanence? And how to direct the mind in front without exertion. And then we come back to ourselves. Next, we are going to wish all beings behind. May they be well and happy. And then we come back to ourselves. Doing loving kindness uh, should actually be a very joyful process, you know. Some people do it with a long face. That means something is wrong really. I must adjust the thoughts. Right? I must have the right thought. Yeah, and that means uh, you're know, clinging on to something or holding on to some uh, preconceived idea. Right, so the whole idea is uh, to be a passive observer. That means not to not to cling on a previous experience, right? Not, not to hold on to a previous perception. Right, whatever when you pay attention to a certain direction, whatever happens, let it happen, no, by itself. Yeah, so you come back to ourselves, and then now we uh, we wish all beings on the left. May they be well and happy. And then come back to ourselves. And we wish all beings on the right. May they be well and happy. And then we come back to ourselves. And now we wish all beings above, may they be well and happy. And then we come back to ourselves and we wish may all beings below be well and happy. And then we come back to ourselves.
this time we wish our entire body well and happy yeah, from head to toe and we wish this entire body well and happy Feel this whole body with loving kindness, every cell, every pore. And eventually we Radiate this loving kindness in all directions, above, below, and all across. And may all beings, uh, we start first with this, uh, <coughs> your house, yeah? We wish all beings at home be well and happy. Uh, still mindful of impermanence, mindful of uh, being at ease. And we extend the loving kindness to your neighborhood. And may all beings in the entire neighborhood be well and happy. And then we extend this loving kindness to the entire country. May all beings in this country be well and happy. And then extend this loving kindness to the whole world. May all beings on planet Earth be well and happy. And eventually, we wish all beings in the entire universe, may all beings be well and happy.
and be one with this loving kindness. Okay, so you maintain this uh, boundless uh, loving kindness, right? be it standing, walking, sitting, or lying down. Right? So this, uh, again, reminder from the Karanya Metta Sutta. <clears throat> so this is like a power-saving mode. Huh? Yeah, to prevent a uh, person lose all their samadhi. So if you are ready, then you can uh, uh, maintain this mindfulness or loving kindness and gently uh, open your eyes. Right, so physically, we may end the uh, formal sitting, but mentally, right, we are still meditating. Right? So actually, meditation is uh, uh, all around the clock concept. I want to break the stereotype. Yeah, meditation is not just uh, just sitting or walking, uh, the formal walking, yeah, but uh, throughout the day. Okay, so we yeah, end a bit early, so we have more time for Q and A, right? This is the last segment of the retreat, right? so we have more time for people to uh, throw in any questions. Yeah, Terence, I can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah, I'll mute everyone. Okay, now everyone is uh, on already. You all can start asking questions. Can hear all sorts of noise already. Bhante, I got a few questions. Oh, yes. The, the, the first one concerning the state of concentration that uh, Bhante went through. Uh, mm -hmm. Concentration one, two, three, four. I think that one refers to the jhana one, two, three, four. Yep. So, so uh, Bhante was asking us to remember the emotion. Yeah. The emotion that we experience uh, from one level to the next level, would, would that, would that uh, remembering the emotion become a form of attachment 
that in our sitting we will always want to like recollect back that same oh, set okay. of emotion. <clears throat> yeah, the, the whole idea of remembering the emotion is to distinguish uh, from level to level. Yeah, so there's the uh, 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 something to compare and contrast. Right? But of course, uh, every time we sit, you know, there's different depths and whatever, not depending on conditions. Right? Right. So the whole idea is just a rough guide. Uh, is uh, to compare the different levels. That's all. Yeah. But our, our tendency tend to be, uh, uh, you know, trying to get back to the same level, isn't it? Like each each sitting that we do. Yeah, correct. There's, we we uh, always we always just clinging on to that thing, and we want to like you know like uh, we have the experience. The second day yeah. when we sit, we don't get it. We get demotivated. Uh, that day we try okay. again. You know, it, it tend to be. So is, is there a remedy to overcome those kind yeah, of... Yeah, the, the remedy is actually mindful of the impermanence of the breath, right? So that will uh, help the mind to have this uh, detachment. Every time the mind wants to you know, expect to have something, right. then the mind will uh, be restless again, you know, we, we will right. be stressed again. So the whole idea is to keep on being mindful of the process, then the, the byproduct, you know, whatever calmness or whatever uh, pleasant emotion that uh, manifests or appear, and that will be the byproduct of the yeah, uh, reflection of impermanence. Right. Okay. Right. The, then, then the level of uh, concentration once we have uh, obtained it or or we have reached it, is mm -hmm. it a permanent state or is it something that we will have to have to uh, like you know? It, once we have it, is it permanent or is it we lose it? It's a temporary recharge, right? It's a temporary recharge because there is a, only a state when the mind is unified. So once we you know, come back to this uh, sort of uh, uh, worldly, I mean, the sense fears, the mind will scatter again. So it's basically using up battery. Yeah? Right. So yeah, so the, the mind will sort of scatter again. And uh, once in a while, you need to recharge, yeah? Enter this uh, concentration. Okay. Then the last one is the on, on the um, radi uh, radiation or loving kindness. But he always says that, you know, when we have done one part of it, like radiate to uh, to our neighbors and all that, yeah. and then we come back to ourselves. So is that coming back to ourselves? We are radiating it to us, or what? What did what did we do during that time? Oh, so so basically, is to uh, bring this attention back to the, to ourselves. That means we don't extend to that direction anymore. Right? So during the time we radiate it to ourselves, is it? We we yeah, wish correct. ourselves yeah. well and happy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Okay, one thing. There's a question. Yep. From Facebook. Okay. How do we practice mindfulness or meta meditation in our working life when dealing with arrogance for superior and uncooperative subordinates? Our mind tend to be agitated when dealing with such people in such negative situation. Mm -hmm. Not easy to spread meta and be uh, mindful. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, true, right? You, this uh, issue can be found anywhere, right? Uh, not just in a <clears throat> workplace, at home, sometimes even in temple, yeah? <laughs> you come to temple, uh, I don't know, might face some such people, right? <clears throat> so the, the whole idea is to, uh, again, uh, first, no, we try to maintain as much this uh, right thought as possible. Sometimes when unwholesome uh, states arise, then we need to put in the right effort, right, to generate this uh, right thought. Of course, this is within. Uh, we call it a uh, uh, kind of uh, supra mundane way of dealing things, no? That means dealing from the spiritual direction. But then there's a circular way also of handling the situation, which is, you know, how to uh, uh, have diplomacy, negotiation skills, you know, how to, uh, how to converse, how to talk in a way and discuss, how to negotiate and compromise, whatever it is. So all these are circular methods, right? Circular methods. So you need to have a moderation of both. So if I give an extreme example, let's say a person has no skill in circular method, no skill in the uh, diplomacy or, or negotiation, right? So they, they straight away don't talk law, it's on, <laughs> it's on quarrel and whatever not, right? Then of course inside, you know, then you have to struggle a lot to, to deal with the emotion, 
right? So uh, <coughs> uh, not easy, which require a lot of uh, uh, Kung Fu, right? internal skill to, to overcome it, right? So I would recommend a moderation of both. So uh, internally, you maintain uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, mindfulness of this loving kindness and externally also, you know, you can try to uh, figure out, you know, ask, you know, have a sit down and chit chat and find the correct time to have coffee together, whatever it is, you know, to, uh, to sort things out. So you need uh, uh, the circular aspect, you know, find out what's the real problem. And then there's also the spiritual aspect, the real, uh, another real problem, which is from the mind, right? So there's a circular problem, you're trying to solve it. And there's also a internal, the spiritual uh, root problem. So we try to be moderation of both. Right. Okay, any other questions? Monday, um, I'm a beginner in this uh, meditation. So okay. I just got a question from my friend when I invited them to join this session. They say, what's the purpose of meditation? How would I... Uh, answer them, I mean, what would be the approach to, to, to explain to them about the benefits of meditation so that they will want to take up the practice? Uh, a lot of times it has to come from them, you know. Do they want to find peace? You know? Do they want to you know, uh, have some uh, find out about self-discovery, uh, overcome stress, this kind of related issues, you know, that's uh, in line with the, the Four Noble Truths, right? So uh, if they do not have the inclination, do not have the, the demand or the desire, then uh, no point, you cannot uh, uh, force people, right? So uh, <clears throat> even, uh, yeah, so this is the issue. Uh, only for monastics, we might know. Because in our <clears throat> uh, monastic rules, we have 16 uh, precepts when teaching Dhamma. 16 precepts when teaching Dhamma or sharing Dhamma. Right. So basically, when a person, uh, they, they give a lot of uh, metaphors. Right? If a person is holding a weapon, you cannot teach Dharma to them. No, that means if they're hostile, that means if their mind is, uh, they are not, they don't like you or whatever, you cannot teach Dharma to them. Mm -hmm. If they're wearing a hat, no, if they're smarter than you, you cannot teach them. Uh, if they're uh, holding a walking stick, that means they're older than you, also cannot teach them. So a lot of condition, right? So basically, everything also cannot teach, unless, unless they ask you. That means they want to learn. You know? they, they have a desire. They have a demand. You know? they, they, uh, there's a demand and supply, right? So uh, they invite you or they ask you, uh, then you can share. Then you can uh, you know, teach them. If they do not have, you know, uh, their life is going very well, everything is fine, and you start to tell them, hey, life is suffering, you know, then they run rubbish, <laughs> go away. <laughs> So could I just uh, give a very uh, simple answer by saying it gives us peace of mind and help to distress? Is that what you're saying, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be one way, yeah. And uh, your answer, your answer, yeah. My answer, yes, my answer. Because um, they asked me, uh, I mean, their question is like, what is the purpose? Why do people meditate? Hmm. Yeah, I have many reasons. But of course, the, uh, the main one would be, uh, you know, distress, yeah. I can't tell them about enlightenment and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, depends on the inclination also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sadhu. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Pante, there's uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, in the first jhana, yeah. there are five qualifying levels. So yeah. does it mean all five must present or fewer than five would suffice? Once yeah, so, of the yeah, jhana. That, that will come from a, a very theoretical point of view. So once a person uh, has been instructed, you no, know, it's a skill set. Uh, once they, they experience it, then they have to uh, uh, practice going up and down and slowly uh, distinguish the different factors, right? Then they can compare. So because it's, uh, it's an emotion, so very hard to put into words, right? So only when a person... Uh, experience it so hopefully they they went through the the previous session you know on entering uh you know, the different levels so if they miss it they can replay and replay the the segment and they can uh, 
uh, repeat and practice over and over again if they wish uh, so that they can uh, experience it. Of course, in your own free time, each level you can do it for a longer duration, right? So right now, uh, you know, because of a group setting, I know I just uh, give the instruction in brief. So of course, each level you want to do longer, you want to do half an hour, one hour, up to you, right? So this one is, uh, for my case, it's just a few minutes and have a small taste of it, then you move on to the next level, right? Okay, uh, next question. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Can I turn it louder, please? Okay. Yeah, Come here. Over to the mic. Uh, the question is about this uh, meditation objects. Huh? There were, yeah. You mentioned there were 40 over objects. Yeah. So should we try every one of it so that we know which is, which is the right uh, meditation object for us? Uh, second question is, uh, hmm. uh, we have actually met up with a few monks and ajans and mm -hmm. uh, on the net as well as, you know, we had uh, Zoom with them and so on. So they have different techniques uh, in meditation. Yeah. So what is the view of uh, Bhante on this? Uh, uh, different types of meditation techniques. Yeah, okay. So uh, for the Buddha himself, he just used the breath meditation, right, to, to reach enlightenment. So after understanding the five aggregates, then basically any meditation object is actually a five aggregate, right? Uh, the kasina is a kind of perception, right? Uh, the, the impurities and body is also a kind of perception, part of five aggregates. So the breath is also a kind of perception, part of the five aggregates. So uh, once you master one technique, Let's say a person you know, travel all the way, they reach the top of the mountain, they reach the goal. Then when they look down or look in a different direction, then they can see the different pathways up to the uh, mountain. Right? Then they can reverse engineer the different meditation objects. It's easier. Right? But if a person, let's say they haven't reached the uh, top of the mountain, uh, depending, uh, if let's say you try one method, then you start. And you try still stuck for no for some time then you, then you can try different method no no problem right then you try different method and let's say you have progress and progress 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 then you stuck <laughs> right you stuck halfway and then then might you try another method and you progress 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 right so uh uh yeah then that's during the buddha's time also the same thing the, the that's why the buddha tried different uh teachers yeah when he was practicing as practicing ascetism uh his great disciple so the same thing and within the monastic community the monks in the Buddha's time also, they also uh, look for, for one uh, elder disciple to another. You know? They look for one elder disciple, they receive instruction, practice, no improvement, then they look for another senior monk right, for instruction. No improvement, and then they look for the Buddha. But sometimes the Buddha not around. You know? India is so big, and the Buddha walk, 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 when he travel, <laughs> where is he? Uh, last time, no telephone, no, no Zoom, right? So, uh, you know, they cannot find the Buddha. Right? So, they have to, the next best person is to look for another uh, senior monk. So that was the, the problem also last time. So every person have their own preference, right? Every senior monk have their own preference. They like certain, uh, certain method works for them, right? So it works for them, then uh, they, they, they just share, share what they know with you, law, right? So if it works for you, good. If it doesn't work for you, then uh, they may or may not have the skill like the Buddha, right? The Buddha sometimes, no, he can maybe see your past life, or maybe you know, read your mind, whatever it is, then you can give the, the proper meditation object to you. Right? Thank you, Bande. Okay, no problem. Okay, any other questions? Bande, you have given us the uh, directed and directed uh, factors. So yeah. from uh, that, uh, what what is the general composition of this directed and directed in our our daily practice? Let's say do we do 50 50, 60 40, or we just stay or uh, directed most of the time, and directed most of the time? How how do we uh, segment the, uh, the this directed and directed practice on our daily basis? Yeah, uh, it's up to individual. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, there's no right or wrong. Answer is uh, totally up to your time management, yeah, and also your your sort of lifestyle. Uh, if let's say your your life have a lot of work, 
uh, then of course uh, you have lesser time right for the directed uh, meditation but let's say if a person is uh, maybe semi retired you know, like living like a yogi right then a lot of time to you know to experiment and, and enter deeper states of concentration and by all means yeah mm. but uh because i've been using uh breath for a long time yep so even even i was trying to do the undirected I yeah. tend to uh, I tend to get hooked up on the breath while while we're supposed uh, to experience the feeling and all the other things, the yeah. interactive version. Yeah. But the mind tend to be like you know, get, you know, the mind seems to be directed yeah. towards the breath more than uh, you know, like trying to follow yeah. Bhatti's instruction of you know, feeling feeling everything. Automatically, uh, it likes uh, to come back, right? The, yeah, you always go back to a yeah. breath, you know. So while while you are just like that, you. The breath becomes the leading object, you know. So you just be I doing see. in out, in out, in out, but rather than, uh, but periodically I will try to like send it out to sense the mm. sitting position or the pain mm. or, but you know the 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 mm. breath seems to be the main attraction. Ah, okay, yeah. So if, if let's say you're you're uh, really used to you know fixing the mind because or maybe long years of practice, then uh, the breath meditation itself. Is also uh, and there's uh, that's why we talk about in tandem, right? There's actually both uh, vipassana elements in the micro attention. There's a micro birth and death, right? So every breath moment, so there's a combination of both uh, samatha and vipassana actually in in the breath practice, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So you if you want to practice unconditioned, uh, slowly extend out, then uh, you can start off with feeling with the. Uh, uh, you know, from a small parameter, then extend to a wider parameter, which is the body, yeah. right? So after the body, then you can extend further to the six senses, hearing, mm -hmm. you know, smelling, see, seeing, tasting, etc. Right? Thanks, Bhante. Okay, no problem. Any other uh, questions? Yes, uh, one. Yeah. Uh, but they, how true is it that the meta meditation doesn't lead to enlightenment? <clears throat> Does, <laughs> yeah, these these usually are the uh, misconceptions uh, from the uh, pro uh, post canonical uh, books, right? Then they have the uh, for example, let's say the Visuddhi Maga, they tell you oh, loving kindness can maximum reach third jhana, for example. Right, whereas a lot of the, the suttas uh, talk about the four Brahma Viharas you know, can reach enlightenment. Right? And the four Brahma Viharas can also uh, directly, if you talk about concentration, can you know, immediately uh, go to the formless concentrations first. So there's a lot of this contradiction between the post canonical manual and the uh, original suttas. Right? A lot of contradiction. Right? So, uh, uh, so these uh, contradictions, especially I talk about uh, uh, giving instructions. Some people, if they, they are not uh, well informed, then they thought, oh, yeah, this is the only way. Then the, the manual will tell you, oh, this uh, meditation can maximum reach here. They need to put in U turn and try another thing and whatever. Not. So uh, may obstruct them in a certain way. Right? May obstruct them in a certain way. Right? So uh, I can uh, give the links to you later. Uh, yeah, in, in fact, in my <coughs> uh, Facebook, my uh, background photo, right, I have this uh, uh, make appointment online meditation. And in the commentary, I mean, in the comments, in the comments, there's a website uh, to my Facebook notes, notes on my Facebook that talks about meditation resource. So there's a lot of links that talk about uh, even the four Brahma Viharas able to reach uh, the seven factors of enlightenment and even liberation, right? All right. Uh, okay. Next is... Uh, would Bhante encourage beginners in meditation practice to meditate in the graveyard or by the <laughs> cops to remind them of death? Would it be advisable to spread metta in a graveyard to the spirits there? Yeah, like this uh, graveyard meditation has been uh, 
uh, interesting, uh, probably a social gathering or even fundraising activity for some <laughs> Buddhist uh, organizations. Eh? <coughs> uh, like earlier on, in, right from the beginning of the talk, uh, I talked about the Megia Sutta, the example, uh, not recommended for uh, beginners. If let's say you want to go alone, right? Uh, not encouraged if your foundation is not there, your mind, you do not know how to uh, stay mindful even from day to day life. You want to try uh, adventure, uh, then there's no different from uh, going for adventure camp. Uh, like even for guys in Singapore, we have national uh, compulsory national service. We also go to the forest, all right? So, uh, uh, not not really a big deal, and it ends up be, becoming like an adventure thrill, right? Some people go to escape theme parks, uh, they go to certain theme parks with a lot of horror, try to escape the room, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so, uh, not much difference. It, it ends up becoming like a social or entertainment kind of activity. So, it depends on your mindset. So, the whole idea is uh, get your framework right. Right. Um, once your, I mean, the mental programming is correct, uh, you know how to uh, practice, uh, you know, uh, sense restraint, moment to moment. Then uh, wherever you go, then it's no issue. Right. So this is more important: the, the mental conditioning. Yeah. Anything else from the floor? Um, I think the question that there's a second part to the question that, that Terence just read out. Uh, this brother asked whether it is advisable to send meta to uh, spirits in the graveyard. Is it a good idea like we go and go for Ching Bing? Is it good a good idea to radiate meta to all these spirits uh, hanging around there if there are? Yeah, so when we radiate uh, the the original instruction, I mean from the suttas, right? is uh, radiant uh, metta to all beings, right, to all beings. So wherever you go, right, where, be it a forest, in a cemetery, in a graveyard, or even at home, right, uh, you know, it's uh, good to have this practice, radiate loving kindness to all beings, right. So the whole idea is first uh, have a good foundation. That means we practice loving kindness without attachment. Not easy, but you no, know, that's why you need to keep practicing over and over again, not Wait until the last moment, no? uh, last moment when people face trouble or face crisis, I then start to think of maybe the Buddha's name or think of loving kindness, whatever object you're told to practice. Uh, then you last minute, uh, Chinese say, Ling si pao fo jia, right? last <laughs> minute then uh, start to hug the Buddha's leg. Right? That's this Chinese idiom. Right? So we, we don't uh, do this. Eh? So we consistently you know, practice. So in uh, daily life, you know, we face whatever situation, be it a scary situation, stressful situation, uh, depressing situation, whatever it is, you know, uh, can we have equanimity, right, in the midst of the, the vicissitudes of life, ups and downs of life. So once we're able to have a firm equipoise, you know, the mind's equal, then you, you can sometimes even want to challenge yourself, you know, that you purposely want to go to forest, uh, purposely want to go to graveyard. Uh, this requires certain level of maturity first, spiritual maturity, uh, then you can test yourself. Uh, if not, then every day is actually a test. Right? We take every day as a test first. Right? So like, let's say yeah, you, uh, you have a family function, a ching bing function, want to go to graveyard, yeah, then no, no problem, you can go attend, no issue. Right? I'm just wondering whether um, I know the, the, the Taoists have this uh, tampantang larang thing. So if we go to the graveyard and start radiating metta or chanting, will these spirits follow us home or not? <laughs> oh. <laughs> because they like us so much, they want to hear the chanting, they love the yeah. metta, so they will follow us home. Uh. Uh, and some ghosts, is it, NG? <laughs> yeah, no, so yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of stories you hear, you know, people get possessed by such things. Uh. I'm not sure. Okay, if you, you have uh, you are practicing uh, well, that means you have your you, know, you keep your precepts. Uh, you, then you uh, practice meditation uh, consistently. <clears throat> then in fact, who knows? Even right now, there are beings surrounding you, right? So these are what we call the guardian uh, spirits, guardian deities. So nothing wrong to have more, right? The more the merrier, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, okay. It's better than the, the good ones. Then uh, if a person left unguarded, then uh, the, the unwholesome ones will get you, right? So uh, <clears throat> for, for heavenly beings, right? Uh, normally, we, we say the, the, the earthbound deities will be the first responders. They're the first responders. So like uh, these deities, <clears throat> because uh, they sort of have a long lifespan and they are supposed to be, you know, uh, free from uh, poverty, you know, free from, uh, you know, they don't need to have charity. So they do not know where to look for doing good. Yeah, because up there, we got poor, we got hungry, right? <laughs> so the next best place to go to is the human realm. Next best place to go to is the human realm. So among the humans, uh, they, they, are they supposed to help the, the unwholesome people or the wholesome people, right? To make merit. <clears throat> so the wise choice is to you know, look for the uh, wholesome people to invest. Right? So if you consistently uh, practice doing good, think of wholesome thoughts, you know, right speech, right action, whatever not, uh, then they will invest. More, more of these beings will invest you. Right, so it's uh, nothing wrong if they follow you, right? in, in a good way. In a good way, right? if you're wholesome. But uh, what, you, what, what happens if the unwholesome spirits follow? Then how? <laughs> then, then the good ones will be your bouncer. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. So that's the reason of having the the guardian deities because mm -hmm. there are unwholesome uh, uh, deities in the accounts of this Atanatya Sutta, right? Uh, the the four heavenly kings they mentioned, even the spirits, not all of them are good. Right? Even Mara also not good, right? <laughs> so you need more good guardian deities. <clears throat> Some of the uh, earth uh, spirits, not, not all of them are wholesome. Some of them are predatory species. Right? Maybe they feed on your blood or feed on your maybe life force. Right? So these are uh, things happening. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> There's a question from Brother Kelvin Oi. Okay. Dear Pante, while observing breath in and out, the focus on the nostrils, but the breath reaches the abdomen. Thus, mm. this breath depth at the abdomen is nonetheless rising and falling. Vipassana. Kindly correct my perception. Thank you. Okay. Let's say a person is already used, right? Already used to uh, practicing using the abdomen as the uh, point of uh, focus, then you carry on from there. No problem, right? Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's just a guide. Uh, if a person is, uh, uh, let's say they're new, my, my recommendation will be still uh, below the nostril, above the upper lip. So that will be a smaller point of contact, smaller point, because the abdomen is a uh, no, larger area, the movements are larger. Uh, but of course, if you're already practicing it for many years, then uh, it's easier for you to you know, focus on that and by, by all means, yeah. Okay, uh, the next is Brother Tam Wing Soon. Pante, can marriage be shared? I was told it can only be dedicated. Is it just a play of words? Yeah, it's uh, got to do with uh, translation and interpretation, that means, and how you uh, perceive, right, understanding. <clears throat> so I still feel that, uh, that uh, dedication of marriage should be a proper term. You dedicate the marriage, uh, then it's up to the individual uh, being, right, that the unseen being or whatever it is, to uh, receive uh, the marriage and and they sort of, uh, I mean, they feel, they reciprocate the, the emotion or the mental frequency and it's up to them to rejoice, right? So it's uh, basically, they create their own karma, right? Uh, whatever karma you do, you are responsible for your karma. So that is the whole idea. Yep. Okay, next. Uh, Kelvin Oi again. Pante, okay. is it an app? Acceptable practice interchanging samatha and vipassana meditation in one sitting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, that's what I normally do in most of my meditation classes. Uh, <clears throat> like for this retreat, because we break up, break up into theory and practice, theory and practice into different segments. So we like sort of do one thing at a time. 
So for most of the, uh, uh, <coughs> the my other lessons, if let's say like one sitting at one go for maybe one and a half hour or two hours, then there are uh, various uh, different uh, modes of practices. Uh, but for what we've been through today, there's a lot of combination. Uh, there's a combination of both uh, samatha and vipassana, let's say, in, in every object. Right? In the, even the asupa practice, we also observe uh, the birth and death of your parts of the body. So that is a, a kind of vipassana also. Right? When you talk birth and death of the breath, that is also a kind of uh, vipassana, right? so on and so forth. So there's uh, a mixture. So it makes the uh, one particular object of meditation more holistic. Right? Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Brother Willy, do you have anything? Hi, Bante. There's a question from Facebook. Okay. From uh, Hai Eng. Uh, how do we recognize fake monks who teach meditation that to the extent of brainwashing the devotees to be their slave. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, monk, right, to, to know whether they are sort of uh, <clears throat> real or fake is very subjective. So the, uh, in terms of Vinaya, they should have a proper ordination ceremony. That means they should uh, have a preceptor, right, somebody that ordain them, Right, so at least this is the basic requirement. So if they are, let's say, a novice monk, let's say, a 10 preceptor, one preceptor will do. If, let's say, they are a fully ordained uh, monk, that means a bhikkhu, uh, that means with more precepts, you no, know, 200 over precepts, then they should have at least a community of minimum five other monks. That means they have other witnessing monks in the ceremony. Right, so in uh, Buddhist countries, uh, let's say in Thailand, Sri Lanka, and uh, Myanmar and so on, uh, their religious department will issue out a monk's ID. That means after they sort of, you know, uh, they've gone through a proper ordination ceremony, their preceptor will, you know, will write into the, the religious department and they get all the paperwork done, then they produce a certain booklet or something like a passport, you know, they call it a monk's ID. So it contains your, your monk's name, your the time of ordination, the venue, who's your preceptor, so on and so forth. So all the the details are in the in the booklet, right? So this is for Buddhist countries. So let's say for uh, non <clears throat> non Buddhist countries, or let's say I give a rare example. Let's say certain uh, Buddhist community. Let's say for example the the Plum Village community, the Thich Nhat community. You know, uh, the uh, the monk being exiled. You no, know, the community maybe not recognized in Vietnam, right? But they are legally ordained in terms of Vinaya. So they do not have a monk's ID. Yeah, interesting. They do not have a monk's ID, but they have a proper ordination ceremony. So what you need to do is, uh, you know, uh, you can inquire, you know. Uh, of course, you ask at the right time. Uh, it sometimes can be a sensitive question, you know. Uh, you ask, you know, who, you know, can, may I know who's your preceptor? You know, who are your the monks that witness your ordination? So uh, these things shouldn't be, uh, you know, they shouldn't be shy to talk about it. You no, know, these are proper, uh, you no know, legal ordinations. So again, uh, sometimes can be geopolitical. You know? Certain countries don't acknowledge another country's <laughs> uh, monastic ordination. For example, maybe China, they they ban all the monastics from Taiwan. For example, that is a geopolitical issue. So even let's say all the Taiwanese, uh, whatever, Bi Ji or maybe uh, uh, Jing Kong Fa, so whatever it is, you no, know, they have their own ordination in their own country with their own community and whatever not. But let's say China don't acknowledge, for example. Yeah? So uh, it can be in geopolitical. So how, how do you know a monk is fake or not in terms of Vinaya? So you need to ask, you know, who is your preceptor? This is the main thing. So if they have the, the record, right, and you can go and ask the preceptor to verify or the group of monks to verify, uh, the witnessing monks, then that is a proper ordination monk. And whether uh, they follow the monastic rules properly, you know, like for example, uh, maybe brainwashing and using as slaves and, and uh, imposing or demanding on lay person, uh, that is another matter. So if they do break their or transgress the precepts, 
then it is up to their community to sort of uh, have a meeting with the monk to, to ask for confession or have a, a follow up and whatever not, right? So this is within the monks themselves to settle the precepts. But again, if let's say they, uh, let's say commit a crime, right? Let's say, uh, you know, they brainwash the disciples and maybe now very popular, maybe have certain scandals going on, right? Uh, they may they cheat your money or maybe sex scandal, whatever, it's a crime, you know? And uh, you can't wait for the monks to settle themselves and uh, you know, if you think you need to report to the police, by all means, yeah. Okay, right. does it answer Thanks your so question? Right. Okay, yeah. All right. Since it's about uh, six thirty, uh, okay. DKC, Mr. President, you want to say something? Okay, so uh, uh, today is, a, is already a long day huh? from morning 9 till uh, 6 <laughs> I think I Not long, I'm still around. I'm still early, I'm still early. <laughs> this is very much like our face-to-face -face, uh, retreat. Because when we have a face-to-face -face retreat, we walk through similar... Can't hear, can't hear. The, it, it, when we have the face-to-face -face retreat, we also walk through similar kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, the processes and all that. We have, Dharma sharing, after that we have a meditation, you know, we also take this long to complete a day's retreat. So, you know, this is the first time we have this online experience. Hopefully, uh, we can share this experience with more people because most of them just don't find it, you know, used to that online version, you know, so how am I going to do meditation online? But, but today, you know, I, I find it's very engaging and yes, very good. We, we can, yeah, we can learn quite a lot about, uh, you know the different approaches and all that because we might be limited to one style most of the time so when you hear other monks sharing the other views like directed undirected these are new words that we are hearing because they always used to hear samatha vipassana <laughs> samatha you know and then we end up yeah. having two different schools challenging each other and say i'm right you're wrong you're right i'm wrong you know so if you say directed and directed and incorporating both into that uh, practice itself you know seems to be uh, some something that is new to new to me, and I think the rest I'm not sure, but it, it is uh, pretty engaging. So, on behalf of MSBS, you know, I thank Bante for your time, and uh, okay. we'll meet again next Saturday. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, thank yeah. you very much for inviting me yeah. to the session. Right. Yeah. So we'll say sadhu three times. Yeah. So okay. Bante. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. Well, really. Anything before we share the merits, we dedicate the merits. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's not much happening in uh, Facebook except for uh, thank you one day for the wonderful sessions for today. Yeah, really right. uh, uh, enjoying the explanations and the whole section itself. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Bante, uh, ah, okay. can you see the screen now? Okay. Can yeah, Bante okay. help to lead us in dedicate the merits and aspiration until we reach uh, enlightenment? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a uh, <clears throat> dedication chant, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there's one person who joined, so it's just uh, about to end. Akasata Chapumata Devanaga Mahidika Punyang Tang Anumoditwa Chirangra Kantu Loka Sasanang Eta Vata Jamehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Deva Sabe Puta Sabe Sata Anumodan to Saba Sampatisidia Idang Minyatinang Ho to Sukita Hon to Nyatayo Idang Minyatinang Ho to Sukita Hon to Nyatayo Idang Minyatinang Ho to Sukita Hon to Nyatayo Imina punya kamena mame bala samagamo, 
Sata samagamo hotu yavani bana padia. Sata Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Pati, for the wonderful Good session. Good evening. Okay, see you all next week. I yeah, hope you all enjoyed the session like I did. Just a reminder, next week we'll be having the same session on part two. Uh, oh, sorry, this it's one is... The is Tuesday's the, class. <laughs> Tuesday's class, that one is uh, another slide. This one will be happening on the 21st after our session on the 18th. Yeah, the, uh, the session on the 18th will be opening at the same time, around 9 a.m. Yeah, you can lock in 10 minutes before. Yeah. Uh, then before we end, we ask for forgiveness for any shortcoming. Yeah. By any unwholesome act, by body, speech, or mind, whether intentionally or intentionally. Abante. Yeah, same here. Okay, last but not least, happy birthday again, Bante. Happy oh, okay, early yeah. birthday. Okay. <laughs> early, early birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and those Sorry, born in yeah. July. <laughs> yeah, I wish uh, you all well and happy. Right? Thank you. Thank you, Bante. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Wishing Bante good health and yeah. peace. Yes, I do. I See you next Saturday. Hope all, right. all of us will be here. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, this uh, session has been uh, shared, is shared by MSBS and Mudita. It's the co-organizer. Ah, okay. For your info. Okay, we shall end here. Thanks right. everyone for staying up until now. Bye-bye. Okay, bye bye. bye.